All right. Hello, everybody. Thanks for hanging out today. I already told the team I'm never doing another talk in a hotel conference center ever again. This place is way cooler. So thanks for hanging out. Uh, I'm going to do our, my best to stay on schedule today. A little bit about me. My name is Max Rogers. I am the director of the Threat Operations Center at Huntress. Uh, before joining the Huntress team about a year ago, I was with Mandiant and FireEye for about eight years, primarily focused on Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 type environments. A lot of 50,000 endpoint, 100,000 endpoint type environments, uh, doing incident response, global security operations, managed threat hunting, and detection engineering. So a little bit about Huntress, because a lot of people haven't heard of us before, and we've changed a lot in the last year. Uh, this is not a sales pitch, but I think it'll provide some good context into what this conversation is about today. We are a 24-7 MDR, or SOC as a service. We focus primarily on small and mid-sized companies, and we are deployed to about over 1.6 million endpoints today. And what that really turns into is roughly four to 10 hands-on intrusions every single week. And so we see about one or two a day. Um, and when I say hands-on intrusion, I'm pretty much talking about somebody is actively sitting on their computer somewhere in the world facilitating an attack, moving through the environment, and trying to deploy ransomware or complete their mission in some environment. To do that, we leverage our own EDR. We also use Microsoft Defender. And we have a legacy Huntress agent that we use on the endpoint as well. So about 15 years ago, if you've been in information security since about then, you probably remember the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. Uh, this was one of the first big things that we saw picked up in the enterprise space to start describing the steps that an attack would take uh, from the initial reconnaissance into completing the mission. Um, it was a good step in the right direction, but it, it didn't really include a lot of the sub-tactics or techniques that we would see attackers using on a day-to-day -day basis to facilitate their operations. And so as time kind of moved on, a couple years after that started picking up steam, you started to see the Mandiant threat actor lifecycle come out. And if you remember about 10 years ago, this is when the APT became the big scary thing, right? Cyber espionage, nation state governments using their military to hack into other uh, companies across the globe, other um, defense industry companies. And the big difference between the uh, Lockheed Martin kill chain and this lifecycle was mainly that it focused on getting access to the network and then moving laterally to other systems and maintaining that presence for as long as physically possible so you could conduct your espionage, right? You weren't just there to deploy ransomware. You were there to steal trade secrets or uh, steal information that kind of gave you, gave you the advantage as a nation. And uh, for everybody that's probably in this room, raise your hand if you've heard of the MITRE attack framework in here. OK, a good bit. So just about everyone nowadays uses this to either conduct their operations, when they're purchasing products, when they're telling their hunting teams what to go hunt for. We're all using this shared lexicon, courtesy of the MITRE attack framework. And what this really gave us past the cyber kill chain and past the Mandiant attacker lifecycle wasn't just the high level steps that attackers were using to get through networks. We were getting the sub tactics and the sub techniques. We now have shared lexicon to say, hey, this is you know, the specific tactical commands that an attacker is using on these systems. Uh, and we can then reference that across different products, different industries. Um, it was a really big benefit to us. And so this conversation in particular is going to really focus on defense evasion. It's a very specific part of the uh, MITRE attack chain. And what you have in, is kind of the central part of the attack. And the way that MITRE describes this is uh, techniques that adversaries use to avoid detection throughout their compromise. And so I'll say there's a whole bunch of tactics and techniques that are, fall under this. But by far, what Huntress sees the most of is uninstalling and disabling security software, obfuscating commands, and leveraging and abusing trusted processes to hide and masquerade their operations. And so the conversation that I kind of want to have today is, for the most part, MITRE doesn't really define necessarily what or who they're trying to evade. I think we, we, we're not talking about this quite enough. And when I say the what or the who, I'm really talking about the what as in your antivirus, your EDR, your network intrusion prevention system. Maybe you have a proxy out there or some type of DNS filtering, right? These are technologies that ideally detect and uh, also ideally prevent something from happening kind of in real time so that you don't have to go investigate and respond to them. And then there's also the who. These are our operation centers, our hunting teams, your system administrators who are out there just in the typical IT roles, network admins, and general users, right? You don't want a threat actor to be hanging out on a system doing something very obvious, and then somebody in HR or in the business says, hey, someone's controlling my machine. What's going on here? 
Um, so I don't think we're doing enough to really define, are we evading a detection from the what or the who? And by far, what we're seeing in, in, out in the wild is most of these actors that we're seeing at the mid-sized level, these smaller environments, they're not doing espionage. They're there in that environment for maybe a week, and they're trying to deploy ransomware. And so what we find is they are pretty obviously going after the technology and not the people. And the way I would kind of categorize this, I, I put a lot of thought into figuring out, like, what am I kind of feeling when I'm seeing some of this stuff in the wild? There is a blatant disregard for detection by humans. They do not expect to be caught at any point in their attack, no matter how obvious it may seem in retrospect, they're kind of just going for it. <laughs> and so I even, when I was kind of trying to build this slide deck, figure out words that really, what fit the most for how these threat actors are really operating, flagrant, outright, overt, shameless, unabashed. I mean, that's literally what we're seeing every single week out in the wild. Threat actors who do not think they're gonna get caught, they're trying to get around a technology, and they're gonna try, once they get around that technology, they're free to do whatever they want in that environment. And so I'm gonna share a couple in the wild examples of what we've seen attackers doing, uh, and then we'll kind of wrap this up with some narrative as, uh, as well around this. So this is a really good example of how attackers tend to understand our controls better than we do. Uh, this was from, I think about a year ago, where if you were on a system, you could go ahead and figure out, in this example, it's Microsoft Defender, what exclusions exist on this system? And so I won't make you squint to read any of that fuzzy text, but the story here is an attacker will land on a system and just see, are there any ex exclusions that already exist? And so if you have an IT administrator or security professional who is trying to install some software, it keeps breaking, and they exclude a, an entire directory or a folder, then you start to realize, oh, I can just put any of my malware in this location, and I don't even have to exclude it. The IT administrator has already done this for me. And so attackers kind of pick this up and then immediately uh, just deploy their malware in that location without uh, regard for being detected. This is an in the wild example of what we saw with our uh, Hunter CDR product uh, a couple months ago. So this is the attacker individually running different exclusions for the antivirus product that was on this system. And so you can see in here them excluding specific folders, different files, different extension names, uh, specific processes. Long story short, you kind of get a whole playbook when they land on a system and they go to exclude all of these specific things, you know exactly where this attacker is gonna operate out of, you know exactly what commands they're gonna run, you know exactly what type of files they're gonna be using. And so once you can kind of trigger on this stuff, you really start to figure out what exactly is the attacker gonna do and almost get the playbook of, of everything that's gonna happen on that system. And so one more, uh, a couple more in the wild examples. This one, I always get a good laugh out of this. This was from about a year and a half ago. Uh, for Microsoft Defender, if you renamed an executable file to a .log file, just change the extension, the antivirus would completely ignore it. <laughs> so uh, common malware that was out there that would just work uh, on uh, most systems totally would get blocked typically, name it to .log, execute it the same way, boom, you immediately have stolen credentials, deployed your malware, whatever you wanted to do to facilitate your attack in that environment. So that's a, that's a really good example, I think, of Attackers can pick up on this stuff, but your IT administrators, your people managing your antivirus, probably don't realize that this is happening on the back end. Um, I guarantee attackers are, are well aware of it, and, and so are nation states as well. Uh, this one's probably the worst one I've seen. This was one where if you named any file, uh, after they fixed the .log thing, if you named a, your malware dumpstack.log, just change the file name to this and execute it, Microsoft Defender would totally miss it. Other AV products have very similar things as well. Um, it just goes to show how simple defense evasion can really be when you get down to the tactical level. And from there on out, attackers are us utilizing this and don't have to be worried about uh, your first layer of prevention finding them in the wild. And so what we started to see was AV vendors, EDRs, other security companies starting to get better at figuring out when attackers are trying to disable your controls. And so what you're looking at here is the actual command line parameters of an attacker who attempted to disable the antivirus product, but now Microsoft has gotten really good at saying, hey, this isn't common, this isn't how this should be disabled, this sticks out, it is very odd. Um, somebody in your operations center, whoever's monitoring your AV alerts, we, we noted that they tried to disable us here, but there's probably somebody in the environment. And what I love about this example is, this is a really common case of if you have an antivirus product or EDR product, really any security product, there's some level of tuning and getting it up and running, but there's also some level of monitoring that kind of has to go into it. And what I've noticed is that most people kind of tend to fall short on this, right? We have higher priorities. We have other things that we got to solve for. We don't have people looking at everything that our antivirus blocked during that week. It could be thousands of things. So 
understanding which things that are blocked are OK to just leave blocked, and which ones are actually flares and, and major signals that there's a threat actor in the environment. This is a prime example of, of one of those times. So um, a theme you'll find here is a lot of these are kind of open source, right? You didn't have to go and develop this tradecraft on your own. You were able to just acquire this from a Twitter post, maybe uh, a forum, um, maybe an open source repository on something like GitHub. And this example that you're looking at here is a tool specifically designed to kill all EDR products. So uh, this is a tool that we've seen attackers use. I didn't actually know it even existed until we were in an intrusion back in May where we saw an attacker using this tool, this publicly available tool, to try and kill off the Sophos endpoint agent on this system. So they were trying to get around the endpoint AV as well as the EDR capabilities of that software. And so a lot of times, and that's kind of the benefit of, of being on millions of endpoints is that you tend to not really have to guess and try to figure out what attackers are doing. They typically show you. So if you can catch some part of the other attack and kind of work backwards, you will end up finding how they're facilitating their operations. So I'm going to be a little vulnerable on this one. This is a message from our actual operations center where one of our uh, analysts identified an attacker trying to uninstall the Huntress agent in an environment. And so this was kind of a, a, a big deal for us. Typically, we hadn't seen attackers land on the system, hunt us down, figure out where we were, and try to kill us. And uh, you know, whether even if your security product is password protected or um, you have it kind of locked down, if you're a local admin on a system or you have admin credentials from some other source, you have a lot of flexibility to start killing off security products. And so the fact that the attackers are kind of just getting in, running these playbooks, disabling as many things as possible, that should set off a lot of alarms. But for most organizations, we, we tend to be completely blind to it and don't realize it until it's too late that these things have happened. So it was really great that you know, we had our EDR on this system. We had that second piece of telemetry. We weren't reliant just on the Huntress agent to pick this up. And we were able to identify it and perform our investigation. So you kind of have this scenario where you feel like, OK, <laughs> the world around you is on fire. Um, there's all these defense evasion techniques. There's thousands and thousands. They, they keep popping up. Um, what are we going to kind of do about this? And I think there's a really interesting narrative here, which is as an industry, and this isn't really a red team versus blue team kind of uh, you know, ethics talk, but there really is this culture of security professionals using Twitter specifically to uh, basically facilitate their own careers. So as we find defense evasion techniques, new ways to get around security products, people are going straight to the internet with these things. And you don't have to be a nation state anymore to develop these capabilities. These things are readily available for you to use for free at any time. And so it's really lowered the cost that it takes for these ransomware organizations, these remote threat actors, to spin up operations. You don't need to be trained in writing malware. You can just take it for free off the internet. Something that we in the industry don't have the advantage of, right? You, you pay for your EDR product. You pay for your AV. You pay for your firewalls. Uh, threat actors don't necessarily have that same uh, problem on their end. And so the sad part about it is, again, it is inevitable. Um, there's thousands of these that come out every single, at least every couple months. I see every night I'm doom scrolling on Twitter, seeing the new things that our team has to go write detections for. Uh, it's pretty much a weekly basis. And the really sad part is that threat actors tend to understand the limitations of our controls better than we do. That's kind of a constant theme that you've probably noticed in all of these, where if you manage an EDR, if you manage an AV, you probably didn't realize that these flaws were baked into them, um, but threat actors did. But that's also the good part of this. And that's kind of where I want to shift the narrative a little bit to force these threat actors to have to evolve, is that defense evasion, it is typically very noisy. It's very overt. Uh, and it is a strong indicator that you're pretty early in the intrusion, right? So phishing emails get sent out. Public facing exploits are being, or vulnerabilities are being exploited. The attackers are ending up in your environment. Um, that's usually mostly automated or done at scale. But once they realize they have access to a system, they typically have to go hands-on at some point if they're going to deploy ransomware to the entire organization. And one of the first steps in that would be the de uh, defense evasion in that timeline. And so really what that kind of boils down to is if you can catch an attack around the defense evasion stage, you have about four hours on the fast end between the attacker being in the environment and ransomware being deployed. And now I will say that is the exception to the rule. Four hours is very fast. I've never seen an attacker get into an environment and manually deploy ransomware broadly to you know, tens or hundreds of systems in less than four hours. It definitely happens. I've, I've talked to other people who have worked incidents where that did happen. But especially in this environment where 
ransomware as a service has become a big thing. People are facilitating the initial access and then selling that access to a whole other group to actually deploy the ransomware. And so at that point, you really have this environment where people are getting in, threat actors are getting in on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then they're facilitating that initial access, getting around the technologies, trying to get a domain administrator account so they can kind of have the keys to the kingdom. And then Friday night, Saturday night especially, is when they're gonna try to deploy their ransomware. So you have a good window, if you have caught the attack at the point of defense evasion, to actually start getting in front of this and limit the scope of the intrusion. So, uh, how do we kind of shift the tides on this, right? Um, Offensive actors, threat actors have Twitter, they have GitHub, they have public facing tools. We haven't really had anything similar to that before. And so um, if you're working in a tactical role in an operations center, if you're using different products, uh, you know, you've bought an EDR, you have a SIM, whatever it is you're using to try and find these threat actors in these environments, I think we're finally starting to get to a point where as a community, we figured out how to share our findings from other intrusions to all companies to use broadly. And so I wanted to give a quick plug for anybody who is in one of those roles having to identify threat actors in your environment. Please check out the Sigma project. It is a project publicly hosted on GitHub where all people from all kinds of different enterprises, security vendors, post generic detection logic to find attackers at all stages of the attack. And you can convert these detections into whatever SIM EDR detection product that you have. They're designed, they come with a converter. If you're using CrowdStrike, Sentinel-1, uh, different EDR products, AV products, SIMs, you know, if you use Elasticsearch, Splunk, whatever it is, right? Um, even the Huntress team, we contribute Sigma detections quite regularly to this project uh, from things that we find in real world incidents in small and mid-sized environments every single week. So please definitely check that out because I think we finally are starting to have our own trading post to find attackers and, and trade these secrets that, that we have. So parting thoughts really, to keep us on schedule here. Threat actors, they give us a prime detection opportunity uh, I want us to stop thinking about this part of the attack when they're going hands-on as the really scariest part. It's actually our best chance to identify them quite regularly. There's only a certain number of ways to move around a Windows domain. Uh, malware changes every day, the tactics that, you know, their phishing lures change every day, these campaigns, they're updated quite regularly. But if we can catch attackers when they're stealing credentials, moving to, laterally to other systems, when they're evading detections, that's really our best chance to get in front of it before it becomes too extreme, isolate systems, uh, and basically get out of here without being ransomed at the end of the day. Uh, the other piece that I would, I would recommend, you wanna have two sources of telemetry, whether it's raw logs being sent into a SIM, uh, an EDR and an AV product separate from each other that can kind of watchdog each other to see what's going on. You never wanna be blind. Uh, typically what I, what I would say, an attacker can't just kill all of your security products in one swoop, that's pretty rare. They're gonna try to kill the AV, they're gonna try to kill the EDR, uh, and it's not gonna be done with one command, it's probably gonna be done with multiple, so having that second layer is super important. Um, make sure that your detections, whether, whatever product you're buying, whatever software you're using, whatever sim you're using, how you're kind of organizing the prioritization of your team, make sure you're focused on the parts of the attack that do handle that hands-on intrusion. The preventative products are getting better at swatting down most of the initial attack, um, but whenever you can apply people or energy to finding and investigating the hands-on detections, that middle part of the MITRE attack framework, that's definitely a, your best shot at identifying the worst of the worst that might be going on. And then again, if you can, if you're out there, definitely try to contribute to the Sigma project. As you find things, it's a very easy language to write in. You don't have to be a programmer. I'm not a programmer um, to kind of facilitate what you're finding in the wild back into this project. And you don't need to be super technical to pull these detections out and use them in your environment. So yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me today. Appreciate it. I post a lot of the stuff that we find in real world investigations onto Twitter, so feel free to follow me there. Uh, happy to have the conversation about some of the stuff we're seeing in the wild later today. Thank you, everybody. Max Rogers Huntress, you did a fantastic job of maximizing your time with us.